Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Cynthia Holt. I'm the Executive Director for the Council of Atlantic University Libraries. Um, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this call CBUA webinar, Introduction to Archive Matica, presented by Creighton Barrett, who is the Digital Arch Archivist at Dalhousie University Archives. Um, this webinar is brought to you by the Call CBUA Digital Preservation and Stewardship Committee. Um, and also, I, I did mention this earlier, but just as per, per past practice, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the webinars page on the Call CBUA website. Uh, we'll also have time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. So if you can hold your uh, questions for the end where you could either uh, unmute and ask the questions verbally or you can put them in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat during the uh, during the webinar. So if you have any issues, please put that in there. Um, otherwise, uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Council of Atlantic University Libraries represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of Nootsiebut and Nootkut, excuse me, Nootkutfoot, and the Inu of Natasinan, uh, the Biotic, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, in Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Lowestu, uh, Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at Call CBUA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Um, I just have a couple of uh, quick housekeeping. Uh, if you uh, could please uh, mute yourself during the session, except unmute if you're going to ask a question. Uh, and also we ask that if you uh, if you could please turn off your video during the session, just because uh, we have some members coming in with low bandwidth and that will optimize the experience for everybody. Um, so without further ado, uh, Crate, take it away. Great, thank you, Cynthia. Just going to get to my slides here. You can all see that. Uh, thanks very much uh, uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm Creighton Barrett, Digital Archivist at Dalhousie University Archives, and I'm uh, really happy to be here today to uh, talk about Archivmatica, um, a digital preservation uh, system that we are using here and um, used across Canada and around the world. Uh, so just uh, a kind of a brief overview of what we're going to look at today. Um, uh, just do our introductions as we are, and I want to highlight a few, um, you know, basic terms and concepts around uh, digital preservation standards. Things that uh, are terms you'll see in the Archivmatica interface and um, and just the digital pr preservation community in general. Uh, I, I'm going to just do a very brief overview of what we've been up to here at the Dalhousie Libraries. Um, and then we'll get into Archimatica, and uh, I'm going to try to focus on the software because I know that was kind of the, the main goal here, but I will be talking about Archimatica in terms of the, you know, the functional entities in the Open Archival Information Standard. Let's try to relate it to the standards that the software uh, is designed to help you uh, adhere to. Um, and we'll uh, we'll look at some some workflows. There are obviously a lot of different workflows and different situations that you'll run into when you are uh, working on digital preservation planning, uh, when you are working with digital archival materials. So we won't get to every single scenario, um, but to just kind of highlight a, a few things that you can do. And, um, and I'll wrap up uh, kind of talking about uh, various ways that Archivmatica can be integrated with other systems um, and how that, uh, you know, in, in my opinion, um, is the work that helps libraries and archives and memory institutions uh, work towards a uh, trustworthy digital repository. Um, so we'll include a few, you know, tips for Im implementation at the end and hopefully leave some, some time for uh, a lot of question, questions and uh, I hope answers. So that's that. Um, 
Again, my name is Creighton. I've been working at the DAL archives for about 10 years now. Um, and my role is officially a digital archivist. I, um, I don't only work with digital records. I, I do a lot of work with our physical collections, a lot of work with digitization, um, archival processing. And um, I, have a, I have a background in music and um, that has um, been, I've been fortunate to be here where we have a large archival collection of, uh, that includes music, archives, theater and film. Um, so I, I get to blend some of my personal interests with, uh, with the work that we're doing in the libraries, which is, which is quite nice. And um, of course I'm here presenting from Dalhousie in Halifax, uh, Jibuktuk. And um, don't need to spend too much time on this. I think you all know uh, a little bit about Dal. We're in Halifax, about 18,000 students across a few campuses now. And the archives um, where I work is based out of the Killam Library, which is the large behemoth building on the, the left side of the picture there. Um, so one of the, the things that um, I think for just context, a background that has led me or has kind of guided my approach to digital preservation and our implementation of Archimatica is just the, the nature of the acquisitions that we're getting in the archives. Um, and I expect that for many of you, uh, you're seeing this trend towards, uh, you know, from exclusively paper or physical collections to, uh, to what I often call uh, hybrid archival fonds. So these are collections that include physical material, um, as well as uh, born digital records. And, uh, and when we digitize analog material and produce digital objects that then need to be preserved, we're creating a sort of another level of complexity there. Um, and uh, so a lot of my, my work around uh, workflows and, you know, processing procedures has been to try to um, try to develop new ways for us to handle these complex acquisitions. Um, it's been challenging and there's still quite a lot of work to do, but, um, you know, it's, it's, I think that just the, the right way to, to focus on this, our collections will only become more complex like this, not less. And so um, we try to think about the complete font and not to not uh, separate physical material from digital material, which I think was um, a common approach when institutions were adopting digital preservation uh, programs and, uh, and implementing software like Archivmatica. Uh, so here at, at Dow, um, this is just a, a, a timeline going back uh, about to 2012 with some, some personal and some organizational highlights that um, really started with, for me, um, attending a, the, the five-day digital preservation management workshop um, um, and then being involved in some efforts to organize those workshops. And that, for, that really provided me with um, the sort of the, the, the knowledge base, the foundation from which I felt like I could start to think about things like hybrid archival font and, um, and how to approach, you know, what, what seems like a very large and complex issue um, in, you know, in baby steps, incremental steps. Um, we've hosted a number of uh, Young Canada Works digital archives internships. So we've, we've put forward internship applications that focus on this work. Um, and that has helped kind of move things along. Um, and really the first one back in 2016, that led to really the, the, the business case for um, seeking external support. Um, so in February, 2018, we issued a, uh, an RFP to, for vendors to help us develop our digital preservation program. And in October of that year, uh, we signed a three-year agreement with uh, Artifactual Systems, um, who helps configure and maintain our own Archimatica um, and our um, access to memory servers, you know, which are, are hosted here, but we work with Artifactual to, uh, to, to maintain them. So that work has been ongoing for the past few years. Um, and we, we created our first production archival packages uh, just this 
past spring. So it's taken quite a bit of time to go from research and development to you know actually doing the work. Um, but it, it is moving along. And in October of this past year, we renewed um, our agreement. So we're continuing to, to work with our factual to kind of develop our implementation of Archimatica. Um, I mentioned, uh, you know, some basics around um, digital preservation standards. And of course, the, the most ubiquitous or the widely known standard is the Open Archival Information System. Um, and I think it's just worth pointing out here that this is a this is a reference model. This is a, a, a conceptual, you know, model. It is not a software specification. Um, so it is not Archimatica. It is a a model that is used to uh, develop software like Archimatica. Um, and there are in OAIS there are six functional entities. Uh, ingest, preservation planning, archival storage, and so on. And uh, but the 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 reference model organizes archival content around packages. And so you've probably also heard um, terms like submission information package or SIP. And that's content that is sent to the archive from a a, a producer. Um, and the archive takes that submission package and it turns it into an archival package. And then uh, when somebody wants material from the archive, the archive prepares uh, what we call a dissemination information package. And these are just very generic terms um, um, that, that you, you will see, you know, in Archimatica refers to them, but it's also, um, um, just useful ways to compartmentalize things when you're developing your policies and procedures. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've highlighted uh, the where the SIP comes into play. That's when it's being ingested, and then the the SIP is turned into an ape, and then you turn that into a dip when somebody calls for it. Archimatica uh, helps you with those steps. Um, I. I won't go on too long about this, but I think it's worth mentioning while we're on the topic of standards um, that OAIS is just one of several interrelated digital preservation standards. Um, and it was always intended to be that way. It wasn't intended to be the exclusive um, one standard to rule them all. It relates to uh, the, the trustworthy uh, digital repository criteria. Um, this diagram that I'm showing here comes from the producer archive interface methodology abstract specification, um, which is a mouthful, um, more commonly known as PAMIS. And I have also used uh, PAMIS to sort of to help us develop um, and you know test things, um, develop our policies and procedures. And I like the way that it organizes. Uh, you know, the ingest work essentially into these different phases. So uh, where OAIS and Archimatica don't really say anything or direct you to do anything around talking to a donor, making agreements and negotiating the terms of a donation or, or deciding what you're going to keep versus what you're not going to keep. Those are very important parts of digital preservation and Paymus kind of walks you through those steps. Um, uh, now that being said, you can get into a real um, uh, you know rabbit hole with with these standards and they only become more complex. So um, if you're just you know starting off, um, I wouldn't really worry too much about the internal structure of a submission package. Um, this diagram here I'm showing is is a model of a a SIP um, that comes from another producer archive standard. And you know it gets very specific around what is supposed to, what the internal structure is and how you can establish rules and procedures for the construction of a SIP. Um, I've done a little bit of data modeling around these standards, and it leads to questions like: um, Is a submission package the same as a bag, or are they different? And these are important considerations when you're. Uh, you know, in some cases, but again, if you're, when you're just getting started uh, with digital preservation, 
um, or implementing Archimatica and testing Archimatica, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't recommend that you try to concern yourself too much with um, what the SIP looks like or what the APE looks like. They, they are bags, in fact, which is another specification, but um, it, it kind of, it's, it, Archimatica is trying to obfuscate or make, uh, you know, remove some of these technical things from you and pr just provide a simple, you know, dashboard and interface for you to uh, move content from a donor or a department into your archival storage. Um, oh, I forgot. Yeah, I, um, this is just kind of sums it up for me um, when you, the, the way that OIS and these other standards relate together, it, it, it often feels um, like you're straddling uh, these two different realities. One, which is where you're just kind of making it up <laughs> as you go. And the other where you're just, you're, you're burdened with an excessive amount of acronyms and terms and concepts that are difficult to express, uh, particularly to, uh, you know, management or administrators that provide the resources for what you're doing. Um, so um, it, it can become very complicated. And I'll show when, when we look at workflows, um, I have one example of something that I've been kind of grappling with um, where I feel a little bit lost actually in terms of where do I go um, for guidance on how to make a certain decision around a particular file format. Uh, and when I get lost like that, I just remind myself of, of the basics again, the um, the open archival information system, and that is the kind of the, the basis of Archimatica. Um, it's important, I think, to remind everyone that Archimatica is not an open archival system. Um, it's based on that reference model, um, which again, I mentioned it has, uh, it's kind of broken down into these functional entities. And you'll see some of these entities in Archimatica, uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. There is. There is a whole space within the dashboard for um, for implementing your preservation planning decisions, and in the the standard preservation planning um, is really all about the tasks that you need to do to keep your archival material accessible and uh, and understandable over long periods of time, even when the original computing environment yeah, becomes obsolete. So, it's where you establish policies for individual file formats. Um, there is an administration tab where you can configure some basic settings and uh, work on some of your integration work. Um, there's a, a ingest is a, a bit more complicated, but there's a space within Archimatica to manage the ingest process and um, and your archival storage. And then again, uh, finally to your access. Um, now, Archimatica is not really an access platform. It is used to um, to send those access packages to some external system, such as uh, access to memory, um, Adam. So, um, so that's the kind of the background. I think it's important to kind of uh, to think about Archimatica not just as a as a piece of software or as uh, an end. Um, it is is a means to develop your digital preservation program. Um, and so, uh, and it has been around uh, since 2009. Um, as I mentioned, it is based on standards, so it's based on OAS, um, but um, I don't think um, Artifactual and other developers that have contributed to it would say that it conforms to or complies with that model because the, the model isn't a specification for software. Uh, Archimatica is uh, is open source, which means the code is freely available um, and you can download it and use it uh, for free. That doesn't mean that it's free to implement um, or that, you know, adopting Archimatica won't come without costs. It just means that the, the code itself is uh, is freely available. And that's uh, that contrast with other digital preservation uh, programs such as Preservica. 
which is proprietary software that you would obtain uh, through uh, a subscription or a license agreement uh, with, with that company. They do very similar things, and um, there are there are other options, but um, uh, Archimatica is open source, and that also means that it's easy uh, in theory for you to customize or or uh, develop features that are necessary for your institution. Uh, Archimatica, like I mentioned, it, it performs uh, some key digital preservation functions. It lets you do things like identify your file formats, uh, uh, create technical metadata about your file formats. Uh, it lets you transcode or convert files from one format into another format uh, in, in certain cases. Um, and like I mentioned, it can be integrated with, with other systems. We'll get to that. In, in a few minutes. Um, now, it sounds, uh, and it is, uh, some pretty great software. Um, I, I want to mention now that there are a number of limitations that um, you, you know you, you want to consider when you're thinking about implementing or adopting Archimatica, and that's true for any, any software solution. Um, it provides, um, you know, one interpretation of OAIS. Uh, you may want to look at other components of the Open Archival Information System or the related standards, and Archimatica kind of forces you into its own workflow and, and uh, in, in interpretation. Um, I have certainly found that uh, I think the biggest challenge isn't really an issue with Archimatica. It's, um, it's getting the content to be Packaged in such a way that Archivmatica can can work with, uh, we, we we call that pre-ingest work. So before you ingest content, what do you need to do to get it ready for Archivmatica? And uh, that can be very time-consuming, uh, resource-intensive work. Um, and in uh, what else is there to say about that? Uh, file normalization. So I mentioned that it can, um, it has services to transform files from one format to another, um, but that's quite limited. In fact, there's not always a normalization pathway for certain formats. Uh, I would say more often than not, there is there is no pathway to create a, a, a pr preservation format. Um, so it has the infrastructure, the tools to do that, but sometimes the scripts or the commands to take a file and convert it into something else aren't there. Um, so, um, so that's that's a that's a real challenge. And um, um, some of these notes I have are a little bit more more specific. I have found that uh, if something fails, for example. Um, uh, I can't always control what what happens. So sometimes a failure will stop everything in its tracks, and it means the the whole work to ingest something is you have to restart it. You have to go and fix the problem and restart it. And other times there are failures that that are just logged as a failure, but don't actually stop the you know the program from moving you know moving through the ingest step and. Um, you may want to have those stops. And so it, it does require a fair amount of configuration and uh, you know research and development to to get the application running in such a way that meets your needs. Um, so that's that's a I guess a high level overview. Um, uh, this is just the obligatory uh, link dump. I, I wanted to um, uh, get get these links out. Um, they'll, it's no easy way for me to put them in the chat right now, but they're here on the screen. Uh, there is some excellent documentation um, that you can find, and it covers everything that you need to know about the software, really. Um, and um, you need to go to the Archimatica wiki for release notes. So uh, for any of you that's in, uh, that are interested in, you know, how how are decisions made around the, the roadmap for Archimatica or how are features um, requested, you can you can go back and look at past releases and see things that were developed in each iteration of Archimatica. And uh, you can also go to, to GitHub and look at the sort of the official issues repository. So this is run by 
uh, are managed, I believe, by Artifactual, but it's where issues are reported and feature requests are made, and you can go and see kind of what needs to be done for a next version of Archimatica. And, uh, and the last link here is just to the uh, discussion group. There's a very active and global user community, which is, I think, one of the strongest uh, you know, benefits for considering Archimatica um, as a digital preservation solution. And you can tap into that, uh, that community um, over in Google Groups. There's uh, a discussion group for Archimatica. Uh, so the so the community is uh, you know there's a few different websites a few locations uh, to get different bits of information but together I think uh, those four links will point you in the right direction if you're considering Archimatica or you need to ask some questions those are the uh, the places to go okay um, so I want to uh, shift gears a bit and just kind of uh, spend some time looking at the, you know, looking at our chromatica. Uh, I'm not going to do a live demonstration um, of our system today um, <laughs> for a number of reasons, um, but um, I will, I, I would like to kind of walk through um, the, the application in terms of the open archival information entities that I mentioned earlier. Uh, what you can see are sort of represented in the uh, in the menu in the the menu at the top of the dashboard. Um, so ingest is uh, is the very first one, and and Archimatica takes a um, a unique approach. I, I will say I found this a little bit confusing at first when I was um, just getting started with Archimatica, and I knew about um, ingest as a functional entity and you know what that meant in terms of the digital preservation standards but then you 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 launch your archimatica application and you can see there's not just one tab you, you know it starts with transfer and then there's a, a a backlog section and an area to do archival appraisal and then ingest and um so it's 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 split up over a few different interfaces but those four areas together sort of comprise, um, or they, they, they allow you to achieve all the, the, the requirements in the ingest entity. Um, it's just how Archimatica kind of breaks it up. So when you start with uh, a transfer, when you start by transferring something into Archimatica, you need to you know, pull these files from some location and you, know, you can start your transfer. You can see the little button to, to, to start the transfer. And um, and what happens, depending on how you have your system configured, is that um, the software will run a whole bunch of uh, what's called uh, microservices. So these are all of the tools or uh, scripts or things bundled inside of Archimatica that get run on a transfer. Um, uh, it will verify that the transfer complies with the the transfer type. It will assign some unique identifiers to each file and uh, and and checksums. So those are the digital fingerprints that um, you can use to to ensure that a file has not changed over time. Um, it will verify those checksums if you have them and you've included them in your your transfer. Uh, you know, th there's a long list of these microservices, and uh, on, on, on some level, I, I think you don't. You almost don't need to know every single thing that it does, and I mean that's that's part of the point is that it bundles these tools together and it runs them in a in a, a chain of commands, um, so you don't have to you know do that manually, um, uh, and that includes virus scan. It will identify the specific file type, so file identification. Um, if you have zip files or, or disk images in your transfer, you can use the transfer tab to extract files from those packages. That's a whole number of things that it does um, as part of the work to, to create a submission information package. Um, and you can see here that you know there's an option to give it a name. Um, if you have a, uh, an archival accession number, um, that's you know that this transfer relates to you can include that 
And that access system ID uh, is specific for uploading files to, to, to Atom. So, so that's your, your, your transfer uh, tab. Everything starts there. And again, you need to have your files in some location that Archivmatica can see. And I'll, I'll talk about storage um, in a little bit when we get, when we get to that, that section. Um, oh, and yeah, so this is just um, from, from our system. Uh, we use um, a, 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 an application called Jscape. It's a managed file transfer server that kind of overlays our storage environment. And um, so you can see here, I'm selecting that transfer location and those folders underneath there are, you know, folders from our storage environment where I may want to go and pull objects from those folders and ingest them into Archimatica. Um, so yeah, you can, your, your system may look different. You may be able to browse to, uh, you know, local storage or cloud storage, any number of locations, but you have to configure that. Um, so I, I said that uh, the, the transfer tab or the, the, the transfers to beginning of ingest and the goal is to create a SIP that you can use to create an archival package, which then creates the dissemination package. Uh, but you don't necessarily have to complete all of those steps all at once. Um, there is an option to initiate the transfer, but send things to, uh, to what we call our you know, digital backlog. And um, I have a, a whole bunch of content right now um, in the backlog. It's not meant to be a permanent solution, of course, so you don't want to just send everything to the backlog and leave it at that. Um, but you can um, you can do that. And uh, the the screenshot here um, shows uh, a, a number of transfers that I sent to the backlog so that I could work on them all at once. I, for, for reasons that specific to that acquisition, I needed to break up the transfer into multiple folders and uh, keep things organized in a certain way, and then initiate transfers for each folder. And then I sent each one to our backlog, but then I can group them together and sort of look at them as a larger batch of archival material. So um, you can see in this case, there's about 12,000 objects in this set of transfers, which all relate to a single accession in this case. And you've got options to analyze the, the, the set of packages that you're looking at. Uh, you can uh, visualize things so I can see here, um, uh, you know, the different formats by total number of files. Um, there are options to add tags to files. Um, and to do some archival arrangement even. So the, the backlog and the appraisal tabs, um, they may speak to more to what we think of as core archival functions. So appraisal, of course, is one of the most important functions that we do. Um, but Archimatica and I would say the, the, the open archival specification um, thinks of that as part of part of ingest. It's part of your work to ingest, to get content from a producer and put it into archival storage. Um, great, great. Um, yeah. sorry, just, there was a there quick was a question. question. There was a there couple was couple asking, asking in the chat. chat. Yeah. About, about backlog. backlog. What is backlog? What is backlog? OK, sure. Uh, and thanks, Cynthia. I, I, uh, the way I'm presenting right now, I can't see the chat, so I appreciate that. Um, backlog is um, a term we use an archives to refer to unprocessed collections. So it, it may it may be any collection that that has been acquired but hasn't been appraised or arranged or described in an archival finding aid. So that's the kind of the, you know the traditional conception of backlog is just all of those boxes of archives that that are not you know ready for researchers to work with because they haven't gone through the other functions. So the backlog in Archimatica is, is, is represents this, the same kind of concept. These, this would be a place where you can store digital objects. You've done some initial work uh, to identify files and uh, you know generate those checksums, those digital fingerprints. So you've got some control over the material, but you haven't done 
normal, you haven't converted your files, you haven't done some of the other critical steps in the digital preservation workflow, and you haven't created archival packages, or you haven't, you know, disseminated that content to an access system. So they're in a kind of a, a staging or a holding area, waiting for uh, an archivist to come and complete those archival functions. Does that answer that question? Yep, thank you. Yep, okay. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, um, backlog, so um, it's it's quite nice. I'm still, uh, I will say that this is an area where we don't have, uh, we haven't really developed all of our, you know, approaches to backlog and appraisal within Archivmatica. I, I will say that I, I think there's a lot of benefit to doing as much archival appraisal before ingesting content into Archivmatica. So you obviously you don't want to just you know dump everything you have in here. You want to uh, you know select records as best you can that will be preserved. Um, but there is this option here to kind of you know weed files from a transfer and only ingest uh, what you actually want to preserve for the long term. Um, and so whether or not you send your transfer directly to ingest or you send your transfer into backlog and kind of, you know, go through those appraisal steps, you'll end up um, at, you know, the final stages of ingest. And so uh, this is where Archivmatica, again, it will continue to run microservices. Uh, what you really want to be looking for at the end of the day are green check mark, green check marks, and uh, you know not uh, red X's. You want all of these services to successfully complete. Um, and you know if you have errors or if you spot errors, you can check the error log and try to fix that problem. Um, but in in the ingest stage, it's going to continue to do things with the file names. This is where any uh, you know file normalization policies would be would be run. So if you have um, if you have some TIFF images that you've transferred into Archivmatica and you tell Archivmatica to create access JPEGs from your TIFF images. Um, that normalize microservice. That's where that work would happen. Excuse me. Um, you can add metadata at this stage. It will generate um, a lot of metadata, and essentially, what's what? How this ends is that um, it prepares a dissemination package. If you choose to do that, so you don't have to send anything to an access platform or pr even prepare a dip. You can skip that step if you don't want to. Um, uh, but really, the end is to prepare that archival information package and store it in your archival storage. So, um, so that's that's really the conclusion of the uh, the ingest function in the way that it's uh, achieved in Archivmatica archival storage. Um, which is really the next tab. If you think of these tabs in the, the menu at the top as a kind of a linear thing, it's not quite that way, but it it sort of works like that. Um, archival storage. And in Archimatica, this is really, um, uh, the Archimatica interface basically just provides a place to, uh, to search and browse your packages that you have put into, you know, again, wherever you have decided is your archival storage. Um, so you can, and you can also download archival information packages via this uh, tab. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. You would need to uh, implement naming conventions um, so that your search and browse kind of works. And in our case, uh, you can see the name over on the left. That's a collection identifier. So we assign unique collection identifiers to each archival font or collection. And um, we use that as the basis of our name. So sometimes they look a little bit different, but that way we can search Archimatica for a particular collection identifier and, and it will pull up whatever we have deposited in there. Um, now it does get a little bit complicated at, at this stage because Archimatica 
um, I mentioned that you need to kind of, you need to make storage locations available to it. So to transfer something, you have to be able to browse to a transfer location. To store an archival package or or a backlog item, you need to tell Archimatica where that storage is, uh, you know, and, and how to find it. And that's that's done um, through a, a, a separate application called the Archimatica Storage Service. Um, so when you're running Archimatica, you're really running two different uh, servers or two different applications. One is the Archimatica dashboard or, or pipeline, as it's called. And the other is this uh, storage service where you go in and you configure um, the storage and you make different storage buckets available to Archimatica. Um, so, and this, honestly, a lot of this is beyond me. I'm not a systems administrator, so I don't, I'm not involved in configuring our virtual storage environment. Um, I, I work with systems administrators here at Dalhousie and, um, and our team at Artifactual to, 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 to do this piece. Um, so you, you may need uh, to kind of work with your local IT um, for vendors or partners to kind of achieve that piece. Okay, great, great. Just quick yep. question. Yep. Is, is Dal yeah. host your archive medical service yeah. or is it Artifactual? Yes, I mentioned that the, we, we have a, 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 a service level agreement with Artifactual, but the servers and the storage are all uh, housed here at Dalhousie in our data center. That may change, um, you know, in the future, particularly with storage, but we're um, right now everything is hosted locally. Um, so the archival pipeline, uh, I'm sorry, the, the storage service also lets you kind of look at the different packages. So you can look at your transfers or your submission packages or dips and apes, all of those things that we talked about. You can come into uh, the storage service and and look at them this way. So there's another way to kind of view or even delete and uh, recover files. Um, so just kind of moving right along, um, you saw in some of the other screenshots, there's a preservation planning tab. Um, now, Archimatica, um, the Archimatica website tells you, well, it's compatible with hundreds of formats. And there are default format policies based on significant characteristics. And that's true, um, although there's just there, there are there are more formats that can't be normalized than formats that can be. So if you're in, if you're doing forensic disk imaging, for example, or you're ingesting office records, and you, you could get any number of file formats that you need to ingest in your repository, the, the likelihood is that you're gonna have a lot of file formats that cannot be converted into a preservation format or an access format via Archimatica. Um, um, so it's, uh, it, there's just not always a reliable conversion pathway to be run on a server. Um, so, uh, but the most important part about the preservation tab is that it's, it's integrated with a format registry called Pronom, which is maintained by uh, the National Archives in the UK. And uh, so every file format in Pronom that has a unique identifier, if, if, that, has, if that work has been done outside of Archimatica, Archimatica will scan your files against the Pronom registry and identify the specific file format for you, which is uh, a really fantastic thing to be able to do. There are other tools that you can use to do that, but Archimatica kind of bundles it together for you. Um, in your preservation planning uh, area, you, you set rules, um, like we've talked about normalization, you, it, and the, the rule runs a command. And again, um, I'm not a programmer or software developer, so I can't write these commands myself, uh, but a lot of them, when they exist, they kind of come bundled with Archimatica. Uh, so in this, the preservation planning tab is uh, almost the, the, the worthy of a, an entirely separate webinar because there's quite a lot of, um, you know, tasks or, or functions that you need to establish policies for and then bring those policies into Archimatica. Um, 
Now that being said, are, you know the, the default settings are you know widely accepted. Um, they have been vetted, and they're they're the basis of a lot of you know research and development. So um, when Archimatica says, you know, we'll normalize uh, video and audio with FFmpeg, like that's the kind of the standard application for doing that type of work on a server. So it's uh, I'm not saying you need to question everything, but it's worth um, you know discussion at your institution. What are your uh, rules for uh, format identification, validation, and, and so forth? And then do those rules uh, apply to Archimatica? Um, so I'm approaching the end. I know we're, we have about 10 minutes left, so I, want, I do want to save a few time for questions. So I might zip through a little bit of this. Uh, there were some questions around uh, uh, workflows. So I've just shown the, the sort of the main tabs or the main areas in Archimatica that you can use to move content from a donor or a transfer location into your archival storage. Um, um, and there, there's a lot of steps and decisions that I think need to be made around that work that Archimatica can't help you with. You, you need to have policies or procedures or decision points at your institution. Um, and you can find lots of examples online around uh, digital preservation workflows. Um, uh, this is one that I, I pulled from the Copter Registry. Um, it's it's an, a high level overview of digital archiving at uh, University of Glasgow Archives and Special Collections. And uh, I, I realize the text is uh, too small to read, but you can see um, the, the, the sections or how it's organized. It starts with pre-acquisition appraisal, and then there's acquisition steps and decision points and accessioning. And you do a whole bunch of these kinds of, you know, archival work outside of Archimatica before you even get to the point where you are ingesting something into a system. So um, uh, if you're feeling daunted by Archimatica or that it's inaccessible because of IT limitations or, or lack of knowledge, just don't forget that you can do a lot of work to devise a digital archiving program or service um, without software. Um, I like this example. This is this one comes from uh, some a workflow website uh, published by the National Archives in the UK. And uh, it's just some basic steps for ingest. They say you start by understanding what you have, then you validate your content. You analyze and investigate your content. Um, there's description and appraisal, access restrictions, um, and then you do all those things, uh, which are you know conceptual steps, and then you proceed to preserve. So, you know you can uh, again two examples to show that um, workflows in digital preservation aren't really just about uh, the software. It's about key requirements that you have to identify before you can implement a software solution. Um, so, um, you know, at the very highest level, you've you've got to receive your material, get it ready, that pre-ingest work we talked about, move it to a location that Archimatica can see and initiate the transfer. Um, and, uh, and again, so then what Archimatica does at that point really depends on how you have configured it. Um, Part of the that's part of the administration tab, like the 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 configuration is a whole. There's a form where you can tell it what to do. Uh, you can tell it to skip steps. You can tell it to ask if you want a step to be taken, um, and you can have multiple processing configurations depending on um, you know what you're what you're looking to do or what kind of content you're working with. So I have one set up um, in our environment for digitization projects. Um, where I know that we do our normal, that we, we create our access copies outside of Archimatica. So I don't need it to do anything like that. That's a different configuration than what I might set up for, uh, you know, forensic imaging or, um, you know, records transfers. Um, and 
Now, we're, we're kind of running out of time here, so I don't I won't get too into this example, but this this is just to illustrate that there are other workflows, too, where um, to be honest, I don't know, you know, what the process we should have is. So if I want to update a rule that comes packaged in our Chromatica, what mechanism do we have internally at the libraries here to do that? Do I just do I do that by myself? Do I bring it to our preservation committee? Um, you know, is it an IT question? Um, so the so. But it's a decision that needs to be made, and um, I have some very specific examples of format policies that I might want to change in Archimatica, but I don't really know if I should um, or who to talk to about it. Um, so, you know, those things th there are, and th but that is a workflow. That is something that you'll need to be able to do to update your rules that come in there. So um, it's not just about moving content. There are policy workflows, um, staffing workflows, and other parts of your digital preservation program that uh, you know uh, are worthy of their own consideration. Um, so I had a, there were a lot of questions from registrants about integration, and I wasn't really sure how to to handle that because there are so many possible applications out there. Um, and there are some solutions. They, they sometimes um, it's an API solution. Sometimes people are scripting things to get an integration working. Um, uh, our Chromatica is designed to send content to Atom, and we have started to do that successfully this past year. But it can also receive content from DSpace, uh, or it can send things to Dataverse. Uh, it can send metadata to Archive Space. Um, you know. So it's it it is possible. I will say that it's it's complex, and uh, I think the main thing I just wanted to to highlight here is actually to not just jump right into thinking that you need to integrate Archimatica with other software. It's 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 only a, a a a solution if it solves a specific problem that you have, or if you have a strategic goal where you need to get content from one system to the other. Um, so. Uh, we've had conversations here, and I'm, I'm aware of conversations across the country around Archimatica and other systems. But if it's not really relevant to your key priorities, then you know you don't have to to worry about that. Um, it's it's um, it could be a next step or the next phase. Um, and I think I think I'll just end it at this actually, so I have some time for some questions. Um, I. I also really want to impress the fact that like storage is not part of Archivmatica. So one of the most basic things that you need to do is integrate it with some kind of storage solution. And um, you know, and that for for you Copal members or anyone using West Vaults, that you know, there could be a solution there to to integrate your West Vault storage with an Archimatica, uh either hosted on your own or hosted through another service provider. Um, but even if you're just talking about your local storage, you still need to uh, get that storage integrated with Archimatica so um, our, you know, Archimatica can see your files and move your files into the places that you, that you want to store them. So um, I'm going to uh, end the slides there and um, we have a few minutes for questions and answers. That's really kind of where I was I was going to wrap things up. I had uh, Im implementation tips that we could talk about, but um, I'd love to hear if there are any other questions. Uh, so there uh, so was, was one in the, um, in the chat. Uh, it was basically uh, how much, IT, roughly how much IT support does it take from Dell to support Archivematica? Oh, well, that's, that's, um, that's a very good question. So I, I can see, yeah, Margaret um, pointed out we, we have two dedicated systems administrators. Uh, we used to have two and a developer uh, who has, we, we, we do have, but you know, we have, we, we are very fortunate that we have dedicated IT support within the libraries. Now, that being said, um, our systems administrators do a lot more than just Archimatica. Um, 
um, or the Archimatica Storage Service. Um, so it's not like I have unfettered access to two systems administrators to 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 just keep pushing this along. Um, and I mentioned that because it would be hard to like look. Yeah, I guess you could look at the salary for all the IT staff and say, well, it costs that much, but that's not really accurate. Um, and and then of course we're also supplementing that with a service level agreement with uh, artifactual systems, which provides additional technical support um, and archival support as well. Um, and the data center, the hardware. I mean, there are a lot of costs for our particular setup. Um, that we've justified because I'm also trying to manage the 140 terabytes of data. So um, it, it, it costs a lot of money. I'm not, not going to lie. Uh, so we have a hand up, Mitchell. Hi, and feel Creighton. free to unmute if you want to ask your question. Hi, Creighton. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Mitchell. Oh, yeah. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, I have one question that might be good just to kind of summarize things. Um, what will be uh, like if you could give like one important takeaway for what Archivematica does? What would what would you say that could be if you could identify one in particular? Um, yeah, I think again to bring it back into terms of the open archival information system, I think that the uh, the it, it pushes you in that direction. Instead of having buckets of content on hard drives and servers, we're working towards archival information packages and dissemination information packages. So we're we're moving our content, uh, we're, we're managing the content better, so we've reduced risk, but we're also, you know, inching ourselves towards compliance with the international standards that are designed to help you preserve your content for the long run. Uh, so apes and dips, I think, are are one of the best things that we've been able to do. It sounds silly, but um, mm -hmm. it, it's it's a solution to to help you do that. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Just looking over at the chat here. Uh, yeah, we had the IT question. All the questions in the chat were answered. Uh, <laughs> does anybody have any other questions? You could either put them in the chat or unmute. Yeah, it's 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 a lot. I think um, the one of the, the the tips that I was going to kind of mention, if you're thinking about implementing Archimatica, is to start by planning your requirements. Uh, you know, I can't emphasize enough the need to to like to plan and think about what you actually want, what's your priority, what you need to do, um, and then go from there. Have you looked at integrating DataVerse with Archimatica? Um, it's funny you say that uh, that, that question. Um, when we tendered, when we put out our RFP, integrating with DataVerse was one of the requirements that we put into our tender because several years ago, it seemed like we were going to be doing that on our own. And I would say the landscape around DataVerse has changed so much over the past few years, and it, it wasn't a, a high enough priority for myself that I haven't really thought about or looked at integration with Dataverse. And now we have Scholars Portal doing sort of national level services. Um, so I, it's not something I'm familiar with or have a lot of experience with. I know that it is possible, um, um, but I haven't looked at it directly. Any other questions for Creighton? We're at uh, three o'clock. Yes, and I, uh, I echo that with Simon's comment. This is a fantastic presentation, Creighton. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge about Archivematica. It's uh, something we license, but we're not always sure if we, uh, uh, it, that at least Copal and Call both license, um, but it's not necessarily something we know, do we need or can we use it or how can we use it or things of that nature. So this has been great yeah. to have this overview. Well, it's, it's my pleasure, and I, I never like to uh, run out of time. Jeff, Simon, you absolutely follow up with any questions. We can we can talk about Adam integration. Uh, I was really happy to, to join everyone here today, and uh, feel free to reach out if you have any follow up questions or if you're thinking about implementing Archimatica. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Um, so thank you. <laughs>